Hello, and thanks for joining us today. My name is Michelle Beck. I am a two-time and nine-year survivor of breast cancer. I'm the program's assistant at Breast Friends of Oregon. And when I have time, I write at a blog called I Never Liked Pink. So today I have such a fun guest on who I really identify with. Her name is Carol Wiley. She is an amazing woman who was impacted by breast cancer and always considered herself a writer. And it has propelled her to write her first novel, not a novel, her memoir, Chemo Pissed Me Off, which best title ever. So <laughs> during, during treatment, she chronicled her journey, the good, the bad, and the ugly, and decided to share it with the world because she really wanted to promote better alternatives and options and to remind people out there to really be an advocate for yourself. Because if you have questions on it, so do other people. So we're going to talk about just treatment methods and nutrition and side effects and so much more. So Carol, welcome. Thank you for being here today. Oh my gosh. Thanks for having me, Michelle. I'm, I'm looking forward to this. Me too. It's, it's literally, as we were talking, the best part of my week. So tell us a little <laughs> bit about your stuff, the non-cancer part, because you know, we'll get to that. Yeah. Um, okay. So I have been a stay at home mom for over 20 years. I have two daughters in college right now and I, uh, the youngest is a freshman. So my, my empty nest second act began maybe a, a year ago, but about two years ago, I started considering, okay, what am I going to do with the second act? Maybe it'll be time to focus on myself. Maybe I can write. And, um, you know, I got cancer instead. So, <laughs> so two like, years, mm -hmm. two years later, here I am today talking with you. It has, it's been almost to the day two years ago that I finished treatment. So, um, but I, <clears throat> I'm the youngest of two daughters. So I have an older sister. I'm, I like to call myself a recovering perfectionist. So <laughs> I'm one of those super type A personalities. You know, I want to be uber organized all the time and I want to think ahead 20 years and make sure I've got it all figured out. So, you know, it, it, yeah. And then comes cancer. <laughs> and you know it's not a science but I'm I'm just saying that that the the more I talk to people the more I realize that it's people like me who get cancer. <laughs> well, so. it's really funny. It's kind of like where you in in terms of my work career or some whatever when you're focusing so hard on something and you you're working and you're you're moving and everything's going great and then it's over and you get a cold. And it's it's just so funny like when you're when you're done with whatever that big thing is, it's like Whew, and your body's like, ha, hold my beer. <laughs> <laughs> yes, 100%. In fact, I had many doctors ask me, you know, what happened in your life right before you got diagnosed? And if I were thinking back, there were usually some really big deals, really um, traumatic or high stress situations that, that I was in right before diagnosis. And stress definitely does not cause cancer, but it does not help for sure. No. So it's, yeah, it, I wouldn't say that stress causes it. I'm saying it's probably our reaction to stress because life is stressful. You know, you can't, you can't pave the way with, you know, feathers to cushion the fall. Like sometimes it's just going to suck and it's, it's about learning how to deal with it in a, in a way that doesn't make us sick. I think personally. Yeah. And it really shows the person you are with the grace that you handle the suckiness and come out on the other side. So right. let's talk about your diagnosis. How did you, how did you find your cancer? So the first diagnosis was, uh, 10, 11 years ago. So I was 41. I had been blowing off my, uh, routine mastectomy that they are, I'm sorry, routine mammogram that they wanted at 40. Mm -hmm. Right. So, um, at 41, my OBGYN found a lump that I couldn't even feel. And she's like, well, where's my baseline mammogram? You know, those types of questions. So I ran and got that. And then they wanted an ultrasound. And then from there, they wanted a biopsy. And that came back pre-cancer, DCIS, which a lot of people are familiar with. And for mm -hmm. those who aren't, it's confined to the ducts of your breast. It's not cancer yet, but it could become cancer. Well, it was everywhere from the looks of the x-ray. And so I immediately, I had young kids. I immediately was like double mastectomy. Then I wouldn't, I could avoid any kind of treatment. I could avoid hormone blockers, all that good stuff. In my mind, get rid of the risk and still be me. <clears throat> so I did that. And um, I thought I was living my best life. And then 
what, eight years later, I kept feeling a lump in my armpit and I thought it was scar tissue from the mastectomy. And it turned out that it was some residual breast tissue that was left behind that had been growing and it became invasive cancer. And then I got all the bells and whistles of cancer treatment. And what the hell you think, okay, they, and I've, I've read your book. So I, I know, I know the story, but you think, okay, I'm, I'm having a double mastectomy. They're taking all of my breast tissue. Not that there is going to be leftover breast tissue under your armpits and in your mind just explodes at that point. Pretty much. Yeah. I mean, hence the title, but it, it just was, it was unbelievable to me. And I had to get really clear about how I was going to, how I was going to do this because I, I mean, I tend to run like, like I said, type A personality. So I tend to run very high strung and I jokingly say I was born pissed off. Mm -hmm. So I, I can get to that place fairly easily. You know, I mean, the, we could give you the laundry list of things in this world that, that piss any of us off on any given day. Well, I would just stockpile all of that and just kind of run about half pissed off all the time. Right. And, and not even in a, in an, in a, in a Karen kind of way, but it, just in a, just in a wanting the world to be a better place kind of way and getting really indignant that it wasn't, you know? Mm -hmm. So it was more like that. But my point being is that I just, um, I realized that, that being angry wasn't going to serve me in this situation. And so it, it really kind of created an environment for me to go big or go home as far as self-improvement. And I, I mean, I have been a, a lifetime self-improvement seeker, honestly. So I wasn't new to that, but I felt like I had to get a, a lot better at it really quick. It propelled you to do the work to get to where you're at now. hundred percent. Yes. Now, one thing we had kind of talked about a little bit before is many women who go through it once, if not twice in your case, they, they blame themselves for getting cancer. How do you feel about that? Did you experience that at all? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Because you know, you, there's just so much shame heaped on, um, imperfection in this world. I mean, holy cow, we, we have just industries who are killing it to keep people from from doing things like aging or, uh, you know, whatever. Aging, growing, changing, looking different. Whatever imperfection you want to name, we are creating billion dollar industries to solve that. <laughs> you know, everybody just wants to be perfect and, you know, never, never let them see sweat. We have this mentality of fake it till you make it and, and all that kind of stuff. So when something like this goes down, I mean, at least for me, I am absolutely looking in the mirror going, what did I do that I can undo? What didn't I do that I can start doing? hundred percent looked at myself and went, How, where did I fail? Well, and you in particular, you, healthy, fit, nutritious eater, like you you don't have the things that people are like, oh, well, you know, she was overweight. She caused this or, you know, ate a lot of sugar or drank a lot of wine that was not you. And yet it still happens. Cancer doesn't know it, it. Cancer is not, you know, let's say racist in, in terms of bodies, not, not color, but like what's going on in our bodies. It just right. happens. Right. I mean, I, I tend to believe that there is a factor that maybe we haven't discovered, whether it's, you know, um, a genetic disposition or, it is maybe a lifestyle like in my mind. And again, this is not a science. This is just what I've figured out in my own way of trying to make sense of all of this is that um, probably the way I carried my stress catered to it a lot because when I first got diagnosed, you know, 11 years ago, I really, I mean, I didn't really watch what I ate. You know, I would go through a drive through I would, you know, um, drink too much at a backyard barbecue, I would, you know, have all the dessert, you know, so I was just kind of living my best life. And, but, but I wasn't over the top. Like, again, I wasn't, you know, I wasn't overweight. I, I can't say that I really exercised that much, but I did chase kids around a lot, you know, but I wasn't, which is a, which is a full-time marathon. hundred percent. But after that first diagnosis, I mean, I got good. I was probably in the gym almost every day, or I was out walking the nature trail by my, um, where I live, you know, I, I was doing things. So I cleaned up my diet a little bit, not a lot, but a little bit, you know, and I thought I was handling my business. Um, 
but I, I can honestly say that I had leading up to the second diagnosis, I had a lot of huge stressors in my life. You know, I mean, big things like we lost my father-in-law, we moved into a new house. Um, I had a kid going away to college. I, there were a lot of like big, high stress, big changes, you know, all those kinds of things happening. And um, I 100% believe I was not handling that well. And that just kind of catered to maybe an environment that was already conducive to cancer. So yep. again, how, again, how you say it doesn't discriminate, it just picks whoever. Um, I, I do believe that to a degree, and I believe that there are things that we can do ourselves that can either help it grow or help it die. Definitely. Uh, One of the things um, that you talked about in the book was the the lack of cohesion between Western and non-traditional medicine, um, naturopaths, other, you know, Chinese medicine. How, what, since you've gone through this, what, how do you feel about that issue? Well, okay. Yes. I have very strong feelings about that. Like I, I really just want to shout from the rooftops or, you know, grab them by their ears and shake them violently, but we can just say rooftops. It's fine. Um, can't we all just get along? Like, seriously, can you, can you just acknowledge for one second that there might be something else that, I mean, I've, I've read the studies I've, I've heard from the people that do kind of these natural holistic approaches and then require way less chemo way less radiation like you know so for me I have to scratch my head and go why so if you don't have to almost kill the host why is it money you know and I mean that's a whole rabbit hole that we don't have to go down but it it really makes me wonder and then it makes me mad and you know, then, you know, you get a sequel to chemo pissed me off. I don't know. But anyway, I digress. I'm just saying, I feel like there's, there's room for all of it out there. And we would benefit from doing a little bit of our own research because, because one entity isn't going to give you the other person's side of it, if you will. So your, your traditional medicine is not going to talk to you about holistic, um, integrative, naturopathic, methods. And, you know, I can't say the same is true for the other side, because the naturopathic, holistic, integrative sides will talk to you about the other stuff, but they'll talk to you about ways to lessen it. Or if you have to go in full bore, how to make it nicer for your body, I guess, make it less harmful for your body based on some more natural things that you could be doing. So, yeah. Sorry, I was on mute there. Look, gotta gotta love the chem the the cancer brain that I have sometimes. Um, <laughs> I I've had talked to numerous naturopaths and practitioners who really recommend when you are going through your diagnosis phase and figuring all that out, start seeing a naturopath as well, and it because they can really accommodate these the side effects or different things that are going on in your body at the same yeah. time so it, it cannot hurt to work together so highly highly recommend that um did you feel like i you in your book you talked about your i i'm i'm hesitant to say small town doctor but your local doctor mm -hmm. and who you had for years and yeah. then you really researched different places and tried to find someone who said, oh, you don't need chemo or you don't need radiation. And unfortunately that didn't, that wasn't the path that they recommended for you. So going and seeing multiple doctors, did you feel like you were kind of jumping through hoops to try to find the best thing for you? Um, yes, hundred percent. I mean, they, this is kind of the part that I get really pissed about is that they want to treat it like a cookie cutter situation. You know, we, we may all be cookies, but we're not the same flavor or we're not the same kind. You know what I'm saying? Like I just, everywhere I went, everyone was singing the same song and n nobody wanted to entertain anything other than what we've done for 50 years. And there was, I mean, there were some doctors that didn't even want to talk about um, diet. You know, I've, I've, I've talked to so many people and not even people that have cancer, maybe they have some other kind of disease and they're just like, well, they told me I could eat whatever I want and that diet has no effect on this. I am calling bull yes. on that hundred percent. I just, 
I, I don't know. I just, I, I, str I stutter. I stutter that I'm so indignant about it. I could seriously jump down the rabbit hole of this. You know, I, I just feel like they're stuck in their ways and they, and, 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 and we as people have access to way more information than we've ever had. And we know more. And so if we can find that out, I know they can. So why can't they just entertain some of these things? Why can't they discuss some of these things with us? I don't have that answer, but. I, my guess is they're, they're literally just so busy doing what they're doing by rote. Like, this is what I used to do. This is what I still do. And there are new research studies that come out. And I, I do think for me personally, like I've had in my second round of treatment, all of my practitioners were younger than me. And, and it's not that doctors who've been around forever aren't good, but I do feel like some of the younger practitioners out there. And I swear my surgeon who did my mastectomy, I swear she looked like she was 24. Um, <laughs> but she's learning the newest techniques and newest things. And, um, my oncologist is younger than I am and he's, he's fabulous. And, and it's just finding, it's finding the right fit. It's keep asking the questions challenging the answers if, and not that just if you don't like them, but if you have questions on them, that's why that is so important to make sure you find the right, the right team or the right individuals that, that will work for you and get you through this trauma. I agree. I agree. I mean, the bigger part, and we can get into this more, but the bigger part for me that I really think it's important to say is that most people don't have the resources to search out the naturopathic, holistic, integrative doctors because they are only doing what's covered by insurance. And that's, that's huge because you and I both know that even with insurance, it's quite pricey to oh. cure cancer, yeah. treat cancer. My, my first time around, I literally was diagnosed in early December, but none of my treatment started until the next year. And with all the tests and everything, I hit my 5,000 deductible literally twice in two months. That was painful. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, most, most people can go get a boob job for about that price, but when we cross into another year of surgery and we get a new deductible, ours are about double <laughs> what everyone else's are. <laughs> I know so many things and that's a whole other episode, but we do, we have so much more to talk about. I think we've gotten through maybe two questions. Um, we do need to take a quick break, so please stay with us and we will be back. But listeners, if you need our services, please go to our website at breastfriends.org and check out patient programs to see what we can do for you. And if you would like, we would love all your donations. We are a small nonprofit, so every bit helps. You can text BF Radio to 41444 to ensure that no one goes through cancer alone. Stay with us. We'll be back. Hello, and thanks for staying with us. I'm Michelle, and my guest is Carol Wiley, author of Chemo Pissed Me Off. We've been here talking about her treatment journey and the things that she's learned and really wants to help others advocate for. So Carol, thank you again for being here. I want to kind of jump back into your treatment path, because as we were talking prior to the show, you mentioned that you do have another surgery coming up. You had chosen after your mastectomy to have reconstruction with implants, but now that has changed. And can you tell us what and the why? Uh, yes. So I did reconstruction um, and I had saline implants, which I felt were the lesser of the evils, if you will. And um, without, so when people get their implants, they non-reconstructed people, they have a lot of breast tissue that, that sits in front of the implant, if you will, and, and makes a nice display. Yeah. <laughs> I'm trying to pick my words carefully here. Um, when you don't have any of that tissue, saline is very ripply. So I've, I've always kind of had a deformed little situation going on and, you know, hubs is nothing, if not supportive, you know, for better or worse. And frankly, my chest is a little bit of both. Let's just say in clothes, I look great. I look like, you know, God was really kind to me, but now, now I'm, I'm learning a lot. I'm learning that having a foreign object in your body can create an immune response where your immune system is constantly working in the background. And I have decided because I'm taking aromatase inhibitors and I'm having all of these issues, if you will, that I need my immune system to be at the ready and not constantly moving in the background. Um, and 
I hope I'm explaining that right. So mm-hmm. my choice is to remove those implants. So I'm getting what is called an explant, having those taken out. And then I'm going to have a deep flap um, reconstructive situation where it's live tissue being used. Mm-hmm. And um, I didn't want to do that the first time around, even though it was an option because it sounded a little more invasive. It sounded a little bit like the recovery was going to be crazy. At this point, I'm I'm here for that. I don't care because I I want... I just want my body to, to have every chance possible to feel as good as possible. And after cancer treatment, I'm a lot of people know it's frankly, it's a little bit of a shit show. It's just, and to, and you, you've got a slew of doctors and still not a lot of answers. And you're really having to be your own advocate and you're trying everything under the sun to just make your body feel feel good. I mean, maybe mm-hmm. not even good, maybe just not shitty. <laughs> you know? It's just, it's, it's, I'm just being as honest as I can. And so I feel that 100%. And you, you've made this choice based on circumstances in your life. And that's totally, it's very valid. And many women are actually doing that. Some women, unfortunately do have, they have side effects from, or symptoms from the implants and there's the name for it. And I don't know, implant syndrome or something like that, but it's, it is definitely a choice that more and more women are making, or even to stay flat in the first place, or, you know, try something like the deep flapper. I, I had a latissimus latissimus flap because I had one side that had been radiated. So I had a whole nother story and you know, one of my, my implanted breasts looks great. And the other one, the side that had been radiated, it, it definitely has, it's, it looks different and you wouldn't know it unless you're looking at my bare chest, which whatever, do I care enough to have another surgery right now? No. You know, I've been very fortunate with my treatment other than the side effects of the med. So that's, that's where I'm at, but it is such a personal choice. And I think it is really important to talk to your doctors and your plastic surgeon about your choices, because in the, it, for the past 20 or so years, it's like, okay, you have a mastectomy, you get implants, step one, step two, you move forward. And that doesn't have to be the be all end all for everyone. I think it's really important to know that, which is why it's so important to be your own advocate. Yes. Yeah. I, um, I, I want to stress that enough that again, we're not, we're, we're not all the same cookie, you know, and they want to treat us like cookie cutters sometimes. And we have to be our own advocate and say like, okay, for instance, one part of a big part of this surgery is that I'm going to get a lymph node transplant so that the lymph nodes that were shut down in my arm underarm area from radiation will now work. And it'll, I'll, I'll be able to avoid some of the lymphedema I've been experiencing. And lymphedema is a whole other issue. And it's, it's something that, that not, they don't, there's not a lot of information out there and it, and there's some bad information out there. And it's just really been up to me to, to do my research and try to figure it out and then go tell them what I need instead of them telling me I'm a very, very small percentage that does not do well with compression. Compression has the opposite effect on me. So what I've experienced and Again, this is not across the board and I'm not trying to blanket bash a whole uh, group of people, but I am finding a lot that when I tell them that I don't respond to compression, they kind of want to wash their hands of me. Oh, well, you're, if you're not going to do the protocol, well, then we can't help you. Um, they don't say it in those words, but this is kind of the, the response that I get. And instead of treating me like, okay, this person doesn't present like m- the most of the population. So what can we do to help her? There really isn't that there's like, well, this is the protocol. Best of luck to you. (laughs) The protocol really didn't fit you. So you were experiencing something called courting. Is that correct? Yes. And then you learned yourself how to do self lymphatic massage. Yes. That I do every day. (laughs) What is that? in? What is, I am fortunate that I didn't experience that. So what does that entail? So the lymph system is is right on the surface, I guess. And so it's, it takes a very gentle touch. It it's little things like rubbing like this to get the lymph fluid going in like a proper direction. And, you know, and and I do it on my arm and it's slowly rubbing up my arm and it's like a massage in your underarm area. And it's, there's a whole series of massages. There's a whole series of exercises that I can do. And the best thing for it is exercise, you know, moving around, get your lymph system moving. Um, But if you can imagine that 
that your, your lymph system is transporting fluid that it no longer needs and getting rid of it in your body, right? So a buildup of that fluid can get quite toxic. It can, it can make you tired. It can, you know, gosh, even in the worst case scenarios, it can lead to an infection, you know, mm -hmm. things like that. So you definitely want your lymph system. So it's going to do a couple of things. It's going to get the implants out and hopefully calm my immune system down. And it's going to give me a lymph system. That's going to function more correctly. Well, I'm definitely excited to hear about that. I haven't heard, um, I haven't spoken with anybody who has the, the lymph node transplant. So definitely we'll have to catch up after that to see how yeah. it's working for you and if it's improved your lymph anema. But I do want to jump back and talk about something which was comical in the book because you, you have the gift to make it so, but you went through chemo and you very, um, you want to keep your hair, which I feel you hair is such a part of who we are and how we identify. That was honestly, I was terrified when I was going through like, Oh God, please don't let me have to have chemo. Not that chemo could kill the cancer, but it was more like, I don't want to lose my hair. <laughs> yeah. That's what a did... real thing. That is just, and you know, I, I did, I kind of, I, I have grace for people not knowing what to say to, to people that are going through stuff that they've never gone through. Right. But I, I had one friend say to me, so what? It'll grow back. Thanks. Really? So when I start losing clumps in my shower, can I just jam over to your house and take that same clump out of your head and we can talk? Mm -hmm. <laughs> because like, it was terrifying. The thought, I mean, and the other part of it was each time for me, surgery took all the cancer away. I had clear lymph nodes. It mm -hmm. had not gone anywhere else. So hearing that I have chemo was really hard for me. Like if it's gone, why, you know? So the, the biggest thing for me is that I wanted to look like myself. I wanted to feel like myself. So keeping my hair was a big deal. And for, for people out there considering that, they don't make that easy. First of all, it's very expensive. Insurance is not covering it yet. I hope they will because they, they cover reconstruction now when they didn't used to. So I hope that they will start covering this, this cold cap situation for people so that if they choose to keep their hair, they can. You only end up keeping about 50% at for, for the most part. Some people keep more. It, de it depends on your chemo regimen. The the more intense the chemo, depending on the type of cancer you were diagnosed with, that really, that really matters. Um, it, it, it depends on if you're having the, the ACT versus this versus that. And, um, so how, what did, what did you end up with, with your cold capping? <laughs> it, well, uh, yes. And it definitely does work and uh, or definitely does work depending on the kind of chemo, the chemo I was getting hundred percent hair loss. That's what every doctor said. There was no disputing that. Um, I, it, the cold cap is a serious commitment to hair. I'm just saying it's, you can't wash your hair. You can't brush your hair. You can't put your, you can't put anything in your hair that would bind it. it it's, it's wow. And it's freeze brain or brain freeze. Did I say mm -hmm. that right? Um, like all the time throughout the whole treatment and you're, you're starting it before your treatment. So my infusion treatments took two hours. I had the cold cap on like an hour before to get my head to the right coldness. Mm -hmm. Then I had the infusion for two hours. Then I had a slow defrosting process because your hair is frozen. They don't want to break that off. And so that defrosting took like three hours for me personally, because again, it depends on the type of chemo. Mine was the worst chemo for hair loss. So I had the longest defrosting time, if you will. That's you, if you did the math, that's six hours of sitting there with your, with your little crazy cap on. And, um, and then you're going to be considered a success story if you keep 50% of your hair. Unfortunately, chemo doesn't care which 50 it takes. <laughs> it took my 50 right off the top of my head. So I had, you know, I ended up cutting it fairly short, maybe about where it is now, a little shorter. And then I lost everything on the top of my head so that I, if I wore a ball cap, I still kind of looked like myself. Um, but without it, I looked like an eighties rocker hanging onto my glory days for sure. Yeah. You, you mentioned the mullet multiple times and, um, I, you know, I've only known you now, so it's, it's hard, hard to imagine, but the ball, the putting on the ball cap to cover the, the bald spots. I totally, I can understand that. Yeah. I mean, it's still growing out, you know, I mean, gosh, two years later, I still have some uneven parts and whatnot, but it's, it's, you know, I, I joke that it's a little bit like toddler hair. It changes every day. So, you know, 
Let's get one thing um, I did have a an episode on cold capping a few months ago, and one thing which they have also proven it does help with regrowth. So it helps your hair grow back um, faster and better than what it would otherwise. So that is a plus. And you know, as fifty percent, even though it's fifty percent on top, that does seem like a success story. Yeah, I, I was. You know, I I I even say that I I technically was a success for the statistics that they give you. Um, probably not gonna become their poster child because it wasn't a good look, but I'm just, it worked the, the other side that I really want to make sure people understand is that, um, because it's such a hassle to get, to facilitate the cold cap, a lot of people don't do it. So not only is it expensive, but it's really hard to just get all the ducks in a row to make that happen. Um, when you're dealing with something like cancer and then facing all these treatments and, and, you know, just all of it, it, you just don't need one more thing. So I, one of the good reasons that I did it was that I, um, the, the hospital I was getting my chemo at was one of the facilitators of this specific cold cap that I used. Yep. And so everything was just right there. It was so user-friendly. It was ridiculous. And so I was like, okay, I can do this. Mm -hmm. um, they made it very easy and they get it. It's, it's one of the top hospitals in the country. It's a teaching hospital, which I highly recommend when you're going traditional, if you can get into some of those teaching hospitals, they tend to just have more cutting edge stuff because they are looking for all of the new stuff and they are looking to teach others the new stuff. So I've, I've found some of my, um, my better experiences were in those types of hospitals. So we've talked a lot about the, the side effects to your body and the different things. Let's talk about your emotions. You're about two years out from treatment. You mentioned, how are you feeling? How are you feeling now? It is, it's a roller coaster. Honestly, it, it really is. There are days that I, um, I just feel horrible. And I know that, um, like, like kind of depressed if you will. Um, and I know that those feelings aren't real. I know that it's the the um, hormone blocker that I'm having to take the aromatase inhibitor. And so, um, but it's lesser, like they'll have you switch. Well, try this one. If this doesn't work, try this one. And there's three of them yep. and as well as tamoxifen, which is not one, but it can be used like that. Um, I took the one that had statistically the lesser of the evils. So there's a little bit of mood stuff. There's a little bit of bone aches, but it's, it's the lower one. And I still, I still have the moods. I have a lot of anxiety. Um, you know, I have some funky, sad days and I have just joint pain in spades. Just, mm -hmm. I, yeah. I feel all of that. And, uh, I've been on all three of the meds. Like I, I, and even then I still, every about a year and a half, I take a break because I need to reset my body. And I work with my oncologist about this. Um, it was funny though. I had a, a just turned 50. So I had a colonoscopy a couple of weeks ago and I had to stop all of my supplements that I take my turmeric, my magnesium, my calcium, all of my Chinese herbs. And by about day five off them, I was in so much pain. Mm. So, but it really shows me all the other things that I can do to help my body and that they really do help. And you don't really notice that until you go cold Turkey, which I was, you know, thankfully yeah. every, everything came out there. Well, but <laughs> Yeah, no, I have to have one in a couple of weeks because, you know, I, I've been dragging my feet. I'm 52. So <laughs> it's, it's not so bad. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I hear the prep is the worst part, so it is, but yeah, uh, that's a whole nother conversation. <laughs> Absolutely. But, but I'm, I'm very, I'm very committed to, to my proper checks and my baselines yep. and the things that the doctors want. So that at least can tie into our cancer conversation. I just think it's super important that people, you know, stay on top of it and be their own advocates. I, I I can't say it enough. Yeah. And I do want to hit on one thing you mentioned. I've, as I became older, I, I would say as I became adult, but really in my forties, I developed a lot of anxiety. I don't know where it came from. And I don't know if it was because I was a, a late first time mom and I was worried about my son and, or just life was stressful. And as, as you age, all these different things come up when you're caring for your kids, as well as caring for your parents at the same time, which leads you to more anxiety. I had to, um, up my, literally, as soon as I got my diagnosis, I up my anxiety meds. I'm like, give me another 10 milligrams, please. And it definitely saves my life for sure. Yeah. I, um, I did try a lot of those and, um, I just have found other things that I think mm -hmm. work, but again, we're all different. We all require different levels of help. 
So. Definitely. It is all about trial and error. Just keep trying until you find what works. And Absolutely. we do need to take another break. So listeners, please stay with us. If you would like to make a donation, you can do it on our website or by texting BF radio to 41444 to ensure that no one goes through cancer alone. If you would like to be my guest or submit a warrior story, please email me at Michelle Beck at breastfriends.org. Stay with us. We'll be back. Thanks for staying with us. I'm Michelle. And my guest is Carol Wiley, author of Chemo Pissed Me Off. So I kind of want to talk about that a little bit. Now, you, why did you decide to write the book and title it Chemo Pissed Me Off? You mentioned earlier that you've lived half your life being pissed off, but what, <laughs> what propelled you to get to that point? Um, just, just kind of the in, in my opinion, just the shit show that is Western medicine and the cookie cutter thing that I talked about earlier and how they just want to, you know, kind of line you up on this assembly line and then put you through their, their cancer protocol without talking to you as a person and getting your, your individual like perspective on things, I guess, and, and not even a perspective, but <clears throat> kind of your individual makeup, like we're all different, you know? And so I just, I just would like to see a little bit more individualized care. And, and I understand that, that we are just inundated with cancer diagnoses and that, you know, doctors are, are just overwhelmed with the amount of people that they have to help. So I, I'm not trying to sound like, like a spoiled brat here of, you know, I want what I want and I just want to get it that I just feel like there's a better way. I, I really, really do. And it, it honestly, the, the title of the book came about very organically. And I was just ranting to a friend one day about just some of the, the crazy ass experiences I had going through all of this. And I said, I'm going to write a book about chemo pissed me off. Well, all of the people in my world have heard me say that I'm going to write X book one day, or I'm going to, because I've truly been a writer my whole life. I've just never pursued it as a career. It was always kind of that second act dream of mine. And um, so it was just, it was just funny it, where when I said it, she said, oh my gosh, you have to do this. And so <clears throat> as I started feeling better, uh, that's a relative term, but <laughs> as, as, as I started seeing the light at the end of the tunnel, I, I thought about it, truly thought about it. And a friend of mine had just um, self-published a book and talked to me about how easy and how doable it actually is. And so I, I decided to do it. I decided to learn how to self-publish and the book truly wrote itself. I, it went from blank page to published in five and a half months. That's amazing. Yeah, it was. Thank you. It, it really, truly was. It, it was amazing to me, too. It still is amazing to me. It wrote itself. <laughs> was it a cathartic experience reliving everything? 100%. My husband would come home from work sometimes, and I would just be sitting at the laptop sobbing. And he's like, um, hon, you okay? I'm like, I just got through this chapter. You know, so yes, yes, 100%. <laughs> And now that you've gone through it twice and you've written this book, do you feel like you have a new perspective on life overall? Um, yes. I, I, I don't know that it was, it was just the writing the book or going through cancer the second time around, but you know, there's a, there's a lot of stuff that people who have gone through trauma say that I have found similar. We're all kind of similar and it might sound very woo woo and, and whatever, but it's true. I mean, there's, there's a gratitude thing. There's a, I say it all the time. I would never wish cancer on even my worst enemy, but the perspective from this side is really nice. You know, I just, I mean, I would never want to go through this ever again. And I would never wish it on not one soul, uh, but the perspective is nice. I a hundred percent feel you. That's exactly the way I feel. Um, did you read, since you're a writer, are you a big reader as well? Any like self-help help books or things yeah. to really get you where you're at now that, yeah. that strike a chord with you? So, so when I talk about how I was born pissed off, I, I have to say that even though I was kind of running hot through my life, I, I have always been a seeker of being better than I was yesterday. I mean, always, I, I saw Tony Robbins when I was a, a late teen. I mean, I read Norman Vincent Peale's power of positive living in college when I was like, I don't know, 20 or something. So I've kind of always been on that that track. You've always of, been trying to do the work. Mm -hmm. 100%. So, but I've definitely upped that game 
now, you know, I mean, there are times where, you know, I might get into a negative tailspin about something and I will stop myself in my tracks and, you know, the Bible calls it taking your thoughts captive, but you know, we, we have all kinds of different ways of saying it, but I'm just saying like, I will take my thoughts captive. I will stop the negative train and literally start taking stock, whether by writing it down or just saying it to myself of the things that I'm thankful for in my life. And I will truly take a crappy situation and try to find my silver lining in it because I'm telling you, there is always one always. So, which again, might sound woo woo, but it's, it's true. And it's just that easy. It's, it's, it's just that easy. It doesn't mean that your day is going to maybe not suck, but it will definitely help you change your attitude about it. You know, Mm -hmm. attitude and perspective is a huge part of going through cancer and beyond. I definitely, I I feel that. And at this point in my life, I, I can hundred percent identify with that. Now, what do you do now to keep your mind and your body healthy? Okay. So I, I have, a, again, I want to, I want to qualify that this might sound woo woo, but I, I love I, the woo woo. <laughs> I mean, it's, it, it works. So I do some breathing, you know, if I'm having an anxiety attack, um, or I wouldn't, I don't know that even it would be attack, but maybe, you know, my heart will start racing or I'll just really start, you know, feeling that clamminess or, you know, whatever. And I will just start focusing on my breath. I will maybe whisper a prayer or I will just, you know, um, start taking stock of what I'm grateful for. I, I journal every Mm -hmm. day and it's, it's a true gratitude journal. I even, I even published a gratitude journal for people who maybe don't know how to do that, Hmm. but maybe they're searching for cancer books. And so I have one right next to my book. So that's if somebody, again, the goal here is making it easy for people who are already feeling overwhelmed, who are already the deer in the headlights of what the hell is going on in my life right now. And so it's like, I, re- I highly recommend gratitude journals for freaking everybody, truly, because if you can write it down and see it and your brain sees it, it does something um, it, to your thoughts, to your, your demeanor. Just getting it out of your brain. And, and the writing it out or however you do it, I definitely think is super important. And what about your body? What are you doing now in that aspect? Um, okay. So I am definitely moderate. You know, I, I know that people out there who don't even have cancer on their radar and are just eating, drinking, being merry and living their best life probably think I'm extreme, but I do little things of, you know, I'm more than sporadic about my alcohol consumption. I really pick and choose my moments and, you know, maybe some cool celebratory thing, or maybe it's just a random date night with friends we haven't been able to spend time with. And I decide I'm, I'm going to have some wine. I'm going to do it. You know, um, I remember one night though, cause I, I just want to make sure that people understand that I am human. So I, we were on our way to my husband's Christmas party and I had just had my clean pet scan. Mm-hmm. And so there was all of these months of just trying so hard to eat the right thing, do the right thing and breathe and exercise and gratitude and blah, 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 blah. And then I got that. And I was like, Oh, okay. And it just felt like this release. I drank so much champagne and (laughs) was not feeling so hot the next day. So I'm just saying that, but, but you live and learn. I mean, I, I, well, and two, once you're over 50, like drinking anything more than two drinks is a nightmare. And for me, I can't even drink wine anymore, which I love a nice glass of red wine, but it literally sets my hot flashes off instantly. And so it's, that's it, it. Okay. Yes. So can we just discuss that for a second? It's almost not worth it. It's really almost not worth it. You go out, you're having a nice date, whatever you decide to have a drink and then you hot flash all night. And I'm like, Mm -hmm. I could have just had water and been fine because then I wouldn't be covers off, covers on covers off, covers on (laughs) the the story of my life right there. (laughs) I have found that for me, vodka is fine. So if my occasional going out drink, we, we, saw friends this weekend and went out and I had a delicious vodka limoncello punch and oh, it made my day, but I probably won't have another one for another month because it's just not, it's just not a part of my life anymore. Being, being 50, trying to be proactive. you, You have to think about these things. It's super important. And I know from reading the book that when you became an adult, faith became a really important part of your life. How did that help you get through? I mean, it still does. It it hundred percent does. Like I start my day with scripture reading. Right. And then I journal sometimes, um, what that scripture means in my life. 
and which leads me into what I'm grateful for. And so it's just, it's a process. That's, that's what I do. That works for me. Um, I, I want to, I want to be as inclusive as possible because again, we discussed cancer doesn't discriminate. Um, I talk about my faith because that's my thing, but like mm-hmm. even how I mentioned that I read Norman Vincent Peale way back in the day, one of the cool things about that guy is that he talked about having a spiritual belief. He talked about having a belief in something bigger than you and how that can ground you. He didn't say, believe what I believe. He said, right having one is huge. And so I encourage people to just get in touch with themselves on a spiritual level and you know how it it just, it just does something cool to your psyche to recognize how we are all connected and how we can all be kindred spirits on one level or another. And I just, I just find that to be to be the magic, if you will. Yeah. And like uh, you said, it's, it's not what you don't have to believe this because I do, but it's find find the spirituality that works for you. It's never been a big part of my life, but I, I do believe there are, there are things out there that work with us and, you know, whatever is your jam, whether it's Buddha or Jesus or whatever, like do your jam. And right. I believe it has a huge grounding effect. I think that's the most important, something that can ground us and calm our soul is, is the key. I feel to, you know, just, just a peace and living your best life. Definitely. So you mentioned the journal, what is next for you and your, and your writing dream? Well, you're writing, but you're writing your career now that you're published. I, I have decided that I am, I am an author now. That's what I do. And so that is your you know, title author hundred percent. And I love it. And so I'm, I'm here for it. And I, my next project is actually a children's book. And it's just a funny little thing that it's a story I told my kids when they were growing up and it's based on some silly nicknames they were given by a friend's dad. And I just recognized as I was deciding what's the next project that now that I know how to publish, this is probably one of those books that I do want published, you know, even if it's just so that my kids can read it to their kids, but I have a feeling it's going to resonate with a lot of people that have young kids. It's just a sweet story with some incredible illustrations from a local artist that I found and am working with. And I'm just excited about it. It's, it's a cool women helping women thing because she's kind of always wanted to illustrate and I've always wanted to write and here we are. And so I love that. When you can make those kind of connections, it's super important. I was actually looking for um, a, a friend of mine from high school who's actually an ovarian survivor. She is... Um, she wrote her first children's book as well. And I'm going to give it a shout out because I'm, I can, because I have this platform. It's called (laughs) my first, my first chapter book, the color of the day by TL Smith. So if you've got young kiddos out there, I highly recommend it. Um, But we will also be on the lookout for yours. What is this? Where's stage is it at Carol? We are almost done with illustration and then it's just about formatting and, and, and uploading that boy to Amazon. And it's a sweet little story called mad dog and a lizard an unlikely friendship. And it talks about how, um, how we don't all have to be alike to get along. That's a cool, it's a cool message. So perfect. Very inclusive. I love that. So literally we're out of time. So tell our listeners where they can find all things, Carol. Oh my gosh. You can find my book on Amazon or anywhere books are sold. You can find me on Instagram, Facebook. I mean, I have all the social media, but I'm probably more active on Instagram and Facebook. You can find me at um, the Wiley girl or Carol Wiley and Wiley is two L's and um, please connect with me. I love it. Awesome. Carol, thank you so much for being here today. It has been my pleasure and I can't wait to follow up and hear about all of the things that you've got going on. So we will definitely do that. So listeners, thank you again for being here. If you need our programs, please go to breastfriends.org and go under patient programs to see what we can do for you. You can make a donation there on the website or by texting BF radio to 41444. You can find this show on the voice America health and wellness channel or wherever you get your podcasts. And now you can also watch on the breast friends, YouTube channel. So please subscribe. And if you'd like to nominate yourself to be my guest or share your story, you can always email me at Michelle Beck at breastfriends.org. So we'll be back next week. And until then, remember we rise by lifting each other.